This is White Plains Week, the weekly roundup of White Plains, Westchester, and world news with John Bailey, editor and publisher of the daily internet newspaper, White Plains Citizen Net Reporter, WPCNR.com. Jim Benneroff, editor and publisher of SuburbanStreet.com and WhitePlains.com. And me, Peter Katz, formerly with NBC, ABC News, and stations from Boston to Los Angeles. White Plains Week, what's happening? Who are the newsmakers? What's in store for the future? The views and opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the participants. White Plains Week is presented on Optimum Cable Channel 76, Verizon Fios Channel 45, and on the internet at whiteplainsweek.com, youtube.com, and wpcommunitymedia.org. Now, White Plains Week. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. White Plains, Westchester, and the world, and all you influencers out there. Donations for access are tax deductible. Contact my solicitor. John Bailey with Jim Benneroff, the Dean of Journalism in the City of White Plains, and the anchor for all season, the ubiquitous Peter Katz, who is everywhere, ladies and gentlemen. And now, the headlines. And here are the White Plains Week headlines for Mother's Day weekend, May 11, 2018. Joan McDonald and John Nona, County Operations Director and County Attorney, released their report on the Playland Standard Amusements Agreement. They are not happy video coming up. Caspi Development Cleaning Firm rehires four of seven fired service employees, international workers, but is not compliant with displaced workers' law. Good Council property is conferred landmark status. The Hub Everyday Healthy Cafe opens officially at the White Plains Library, completing the Hub. School budget vote is Tuesday noon to 9 p.m. Lowest increase in budget in seven years. Two propositions on ballot. School board candidates run unopposed. Terry Clemens is sworn in to replace Jim Lysano on the County Board of Legislators. The old Tappan Zee Bridge is rapidly disappearing. We'll have a Peter Katz video. The azaleas come out for mom. Yes, and uh Happy Mother's Day weekend to all you moms out there. We couldn't do it without you. So, <laughs> be that as it may, let's go to the White Plains Week Willow News Real March of Time, and that is Playland. Playland was in the news this week. Playland opens wait, tomorrow, yes, May 12th. Right, May yeah. 12th. And the next slide shows the special report that came out Monday. Peter Katz has the story. Well, you know, John, last week we reported that the Latimer administration's report on the contract for standard amusements to take over operation of Playland, which had been negotiated by the Astorino administration, would be released for public examination any day now. That's what we said last week, any day now. And wouldn't you know it, it the, any, the any day came this past Monday. In a May 7th news conference, County Executive George Latimer released a report on the agreement negotiated by his predecessor for the company Standard Amusements to operate Playland. The conclusion, the contract needs to be renegotiated or terminated. We have to look at whether or not the concept of privatizing Playland is about what will better manage the asset or what is in essence a step to devolve the asset out of county ownership. I think it's fair to say that there are individuals, uh, certainly in the last administration without identifying them individually, who have said publicly they didn't believe that uh, we should run an amusement park, we should have an amusement park. And, and I think the lack of commitment to looking at Playland as an asset is, is what undermines this overall arrangements. You will negotiate the deal very differently if you see this facility as I do, which is this is the jewel of our park system. This is something unique. 
When someone says no other government owns and runs an amusement park, I don't consider that a negative. I consider that a positive. This was the wisdom and the vision generations ago to take this piece of land and turn it into something very special. How you approach the value of this asset will determine how you negotiate the arrangements to manage it. And I'm afraid that my general sense of it is, is that this was viewed as some type of a loss leader, which it is not, and therefore was subject to devolution to uh, a private entity, rather than to find that right balance between public and private interests in the negotiation of this. The agreement uh, uh, stated that uh, the county is responsible for $33 million uh, in capital investments, uh, plus whatever is necessary for the pool, and Standard is, in, is uh, responsible for $27 million, of which $14 million is in, is in ride investment. Uh, the, the agreement also states that Standard does not have to make any investment until the county makes 50 percent of their capital investments. So, uh, you know, from uh, having uh, been involved in some of these public-private partnerships in my prior positions, um, when the private entity doesn't have skin in the game at the beginning, um, that's not a great thing. Is Standard Amusements capable of meeting its obligations under this agreement, and has it met those obligations? And we mentioned the the absence of a key person, Mr. Falfus, who was supposed to, uh, who was identified in the agreement as a material person that would run the park. Secondly, if the likely financial impact over the, this is a 30-year term, a long-term agreement, if the likely financial impact is not beneficial to the taxpayers, can we renegotiate it to make it more equitable and fair? Can we renegotiate the terms? Can we look at the fact that while there seems to be a thought that this was going to be an even split that standard amusements is going to invest the same amount as the county. In fact, there's a provision in that agreement which opens the door for the county to be obligated to spend a lot more, and it's very unclear what that obligation is, and that needs to be revisited. And then finally, if we can't renegotiate uh, the cost, what's the cost of terminating the agreement? Is it cheaper for the taxpayers to terminate the agreement than to go forward with a 30 year agreement? that will be less advantageous, where the county will lose money, comparatively speaking. As someone who has a, had a background in the private sector, where you've looked at contracts, and the public sector, you've looked at contracts here and up in Albany, when you saw this from the inside, what was your reaction, and where would you rank this on a scale of, say, 1 to 10? Well, if 10 is the best possible contract that you could have, I rank this, you know, in the lower portion of it, 3 or 4. I viewed this, frankly, as I read it, and I didn't necessarily read it with the, with the legal eye that John would put to it, but, but as a layman, I read the contract, and it felt to me as if this was an effort to rid ourselves of something rather than to have a long-term relationship that would improve the facility. And I read that because I, I saw very little return back to the, to the people of Westchester County from this and more an effort to try to put this asset in a private pair of hands. Now, John, I was told that the standard amusements people are willing to talk with the county about oh. renegotiating the terms of this contract. And if they can't come up with terms which are more beneficial to the taxpayers, to the county, mm -hmm. then the county would not think twice about backing out, mm -hmm. declaring that standard has in fact defaulted on the contract, which as you heard yeah. John Nona say uh, in that piece, they have because a key person who was actually specified, named in the contract, as being the, the fellow to run it, is no longer with Standard Amusements. Right, and they haven't replaced him? No. And uh, they also have a couple of brief shots of the report that people can read by going to westchestergov.com. It's right on the front page. And uh, it's, but they haven't even do, done a financial review for 2016-2017. So, I mean, that's another default area. So, the report is damning. It really yeah. is. And it's going to cost $125 million to bring it up to snuff, according to county uh, long, estimates. Long term, yes, the, that there would yeah. be a substantial capital investment required. Uh, yes. and, and the county would end up bearing most of that burden based on the current contract. Uh, Nevertheless, the park does open. Uh, we're recording this on Friday the 11th. On the 12th, tomorrow, mm -hmm. Playland Park opens for the season. Uh, Jim, do you have any thoughts on reading the report? You've read it. Well, I, I did read the report. Um, I personally think that we should forget about standard amusements, but that's uh, personal opinion, oh. and I don't know 
legally what's involved with it, but I think the county is capable of handling Playland and doing it successfully. Yeah. What's fascinating to me is this supposedly was a contract that was thoroughly vetted by the Board of Legislators. No, actually there were changes made to the contract. That's, that's yeah. another, another thing that was brought out. There were changes made to the contract uh, in the last mm -hmm. uh, two months of the Astorino administration which were not vetted by the Board of Legislators. And so on that basis alone, uh, they view the process as having been deficient. Yeah, well, the, all of those changes, as you read in the report, are because there was a lot of question as to whether or not the, they were going to make money on it. Yeah. Yeah, and so they delayed that. But be that as it may, it's be that as it may, uh, terrible, uh, terrible contract for you and me, Mr. and Mrs. White Plains. The, the, the second uh, major county asset on which the Astorino administration negotiated a contract was the airport. Uh, and I was told by a, a very good source, a reliable source, uh, as we used to say, reliable source. Is there uh, very not, any source not, that's not surreal, reliable? Certainly not a fake yeah. source. Yeah, uh, um, that uh, within the next couple of weeks, um, there will be a public process starting uh, to thoroughly review the deal that was worked out. Mm -hmm. And also, assuming that uh, that particular deal doesn't go forward uh, to basically start from scratch and and see exactly where does this airport fit into what the county needs, what are the possibilities for the future, how can it best be operated uh, to the satisfaction uh, and to the needs of the users, mm -hmm. uh, to the uh, the travelers who go through that airport, and to the communities and the people who live near the airport. Yeah, and another couple of county, county matters. Uh, county Executive George Latimer convened a Westchester County-wide shared services panel meeting this week, and they have also hired a the um, SUNY Rockefeller Institute of Government and the Benjamin Center at SUNY New Paltz to assist the development of a plan for shared services. He also is launching a nonprofit. Um, uh, tour for low for nonprofits to equate nonprofits with counties services and he also has um, announced plans for development of 74 units of affordable senior rental housing over West yeah Help. this is the West Help site that's been abandoned for about a decade uh, over in Greenberg it's uh, right adjacent to Westchester Community College as you go in uh, the entrance off the mm -hmm. of Knollwood Road um, West Help Drive is, is off to uh, the right. And um, there had been a plan to build 54 units uh, of housing over there. Um, that really stalled out, and so now they have this revised plan, uh, which they've been working on for a couple of months. Uh, the Greenberg is very much mm -hmm. uh, on board with it. Uh, the neighbors uh, in that area are very much on board with it. Uh, and what it does, it increases the number of units by 20, so it's now 74 units uh, of what will be affordable senior citizen housing. Right, and you want to buy a piece of a bridge? Uh, you can buy it. Uh, well, John, you remember yeah. erector sets? Yes. Well, it looks uh, a bit like they're taking apart a giant erector set in the middle of the Hudson River, uh, except the parts are way too big to be put in a box and put away in your closet. Demolition of the old Tappan Zee Bridge was well underway on May 8th when Governor Cuomo led an expedition of government officials and news people out onto the Hudson River to watch crews in the process of dismantling the 500-foot-long, 4,700-ton center span. They kept that part of the bridge intact and used eight hydraulic jacks to slowly lower it onto a barge. The old bridge is more than 2,400 feet long and was to be cut into five sections. The steel is slated to be cleaned and used to create artificial reefs off Long Island. Other parts of the bridge, such as concrete slabs from the roadways, will be salvaged for use in other projects.
The new NY Bridge project director is Jamie Barbas. On either side of that center span, where it's disconnected, you see there's a sort of a stub that comes out of the towers on either side. That's what I call the cantilever span. And that's the one that has to be delicately removed, member by, by member, with a, a crane, not with the strand jack lowering, because it has to be engineered in reverse to come down safely. Once those two sides, those si that side span on the Westchester side will come down first, and then we will work on Westchester to remove the span at the end. If you see from one of those steel towers to the last steel tower, that span will be lowered with strand jacks after the cantilever span is lowered. And that's the 603 foot span which will be lowered. And I'm not sure if it's a record, but it'll definitely be one of the longest spans to be lowered. Then we'll go over and do the same thing on the Rockland side. So we'll, we'll handle the Westchester first and then the Rockland side in the same manner. Matthew J. Driscoll is acting director of the State Thruway Authority. This project is attracting attention all across America. And one of the biggest reasons is because of the design build nature of this program. Um, very innovative, very creative. People all across the country are inquiring about it, watching it. Uh, and learning from it. So it's really a national symbol of what can be done using design build. Once the old bridge has been completely removed, the schedule calls for the southern span of the new Mario M. Cuomo Bridge to be completed, and both spans opened with one carrying traffic toward Rockland and the other carrying traffic toward Westchester. Now, one thing that uh, Driscoll refused to talk about, guess what? Was the traffic? No. No. Keep going. You're close. It begins with a T. The um, begins with a T. Oh, I'm I'm at a loss. A loss for words. The tolls. The I tolls. Said it's premature oh. to be talking about no. what the tolls may be. I heard it was going be. to be free. <laughs> Didn't you? Did you hear that rumor? We'll spread know. that rumor. Anyway, so how's uh, that for a big erector set, huh? <laughs> right. Now, going to the shocker of the week. Last week, we told you about the seven workers that were uh, fired from a local contractor, um, uh, a clean contractor, who got a contract at uh, 234 239 Main Street, and we told you all about it, and then County Executive Latimer wrote the head of Caspi Development a letter, and as a result of that, on Friday afternoon, after we had finished taping, they hired back seven, uh, four cleaners out of seven, but they paid them a minimum wage and no benefits. And uh, this was really, once again, not exactly compliant with the, uh, the um, Displaced Workers Act. And as I say, the, the, any of this feel-good legislation that the county passes has to have teeth in it. The county has to take the action because it's up to the private concerns to sue over violating this particular law. And uh, it's just not, not a good thing. Now, at the, the good council came up at the uh, county council Monday night, and what did that development experience? They got well, th they approved um, making it a landmark. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of history on that property. Yes. Um, and I don't know, I don't even know how many units they're talking about. Um, about 400. That, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that's a lot of apartments. Yeah, a, lot of, a lot of cars, too. Yeah. So I don't know exactly how the landmark status impacts. Well, it allows them to improve the interior of the, of the buildings and get uh, tax credits for it. And uh, th this is helpful to preserve the historic buildings on the property. And speaking of a brand new event, the Hub Cafe opened, and you had breakfast there this morning. Yes. Yes. And re it's quite and nice. Uh, and it was actually, I would say there were, and this was fairly early. It was um, around nine o'clock, I guess. Mm -hmm. And there, and the. the library side of it had not opened yet. You could mm -hmm. only get there from the outside. Um, but I had a really good breakfast. I had a bagel right. and cream and cheese. And, very uh, competitive. Uh, yeah. Uh, now, what, what we're looking at here, this was uh, the, the opening kind ceremony. of the grand opening uh, yeah. that they did. And there, uh, there's the mayor in the upper right corner yeah. uh, cutting, cutting a ribbon. ribbon. 
There's Brian Kenny, the library director, mm -hmm. and uh, that was the list of contributors. That and there was one big million dollar anonymous contributor, but a lot of other individuals contributed to the uh, project. Now, Peter Herrera's operation, uh, they run Sam's of Gedney Way and mm -hmm. Caperberry Catering, uh, Caperberry, I guess it's called. Uh, they'll be operating this uh, for mm -hmm. the library, yeah. uh, as we understand it. And, and it is open to the public. I, I don't, you don't need a library card to, to use the cafe, do you? I mean, oh, anyone no. Can walk but in there's there. a professional tie-in. Use your library card and get 10 cents, 10% 10 off or something. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think it's going to be pretty busy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so too. Now, school budget vote time, ladies and gentlemen. The school budget, one of the more frugal budgets in the recent years. It, they did not raise the budget as much as they could have, and it is uh, about a 2.08% tax increase, and well, I recommend that budget. Yeah, don't forget, because of the uh, change in the federal deductibility, the actual uh, uh, out of your pocket cost will be about 4%. Right. Now, next you're also going to have two propositions to uh, perhaps approve or disprove. The Board of Education would be authorized to expend an amount not to exceed $10,000 from the Capital Reserve Fund to be used for school improvement projects. $10 million, projects. not 10000 10 million, right. Exactly, $10 million. Well, I'm not used to those zeros. But proposition 3 would enable the Board of Education to be authorized to provide transportation within the boundaries of the city of White Plains to students in grades 9 to 12 who reside more than a mile from the school. And this will be an estimated annual cost of 166000 but it is not an increase. So the vote is coming up this Tuesday, is that right, Jim? That's right. And, and here's where you now vote. The, the thing is that they have restricted hours. To, mm. It's just noon until 9 mm. p.m. So if you if you work during the day, you got to, you know, you have a, a, a real uh, problem sometimes. Yeah. Uh, whereas uh, in the normal elections, you know, the polls would be open. You can do it before you go to work. Here, it's got to be after. So. And Terry Clements was sworn in as the legislator from District 11 on Monday, and there's a lot of swearing down in Washington. Well, let me tell you, according to documents revealed by. Porn star Stormy Daniels lawyer Michael Avenatti, Donald Trump's lawyer and fixer Michael Cohen, has collected millions of dollars by selling access to President Trump. The money was paid by large corporations such as AT&T to a consulting company set up by Cohen. What happened to the money after it went to that LLC, that company, was not covered by what Avenatti released, and it's not yet known how much, if any, went directly into Trump's pockets or was funneled into one of Trump's companies. Cohen's company collected at least half a million in money traced to a Russian oligarch and buddy-buddy and partner of Vladimir Putin. Although Trump has been trying to separate himself from Cohen, at least as far as the public and prosecutors are concerned, Cohen is reported by those who've seen it to still be signing emails with the legend personal attorney to President Donald J. Trump. June 12th has been fixed as the, as the date for the meeting between Trump and North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un. The place is Singapore. When Trump went to greet three Americans who were released from North Korea this week, he boasted that this event would have the highest ratings ever for an event televised at 3 a.m. While Trump continues to distract with tweets and the chaos in the White House, his allies in the Senate continue to push through his appointments as federal court judges for lifetime appointments to the bench, no matter how unqualified they demonstrate themselves to be in Senate Judiciary Committee hearings. One after another, when questioned by the senators, they have refused to say whether they believe in such basic things as equal voting rights, freedom of the press, and integrated public schools. There are at least 11 federal investigations now underway into the corrupt practices of EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt and Trump still backs Pruitt. Donald Trump Jr., in the midst of his divorce, is reportedly having an affair with Fox News anchorwoman Kimberly Guilfoyle. They've been seen dating on a regular basis. Rudolph Giuliani and the prestigious New York law firm, law firm that he's been working with have parted company 
This after Giuliani had been talking on the airwaves in support of Trump and the hush money paid to porn star Stormy Daniels. Giuliani said on TV, it's routine for lawyers to pay hush money from their company's accounts and hinted that he's done it. The law firm put out a statement saying it does not support the payment of hush money from its accounts. <laughs> Congress has released a collection of 3,500 ads the Russians put on Facebook to help Donald Trump and hurt Hillary Clinton. Facebook claims it will never be able to completely stop things like that and protect gullible voters. And I guess voters have to become less gullible. How? Yes. The American people have to become less gullible, period. I mean, truly, now. Jim, it looks like you're chomping at the bit yes. to say something. So say something. <laughs> well, I think it was interesting, the comments that Trump made when he met the three uh, gentlemen who were released from North Korea, and he was praising um, Kim Jong-un. Uh, and that praise was a little gushing and overflowing. And but that's but that's his pattern. I mean, this, this is what he he, pray, he tends but to praise diplomatically, all these dictators. That not, might not be smart. I mean, this guy has killed people. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> his relatives. Yes. Right. Yeah. He doesn't change overnight. <laughs> well, few people do. <laughs> right now, some nice picturesque shots. That is Storm King Mountain last weekend, and it had us greened up shot from across on the uh, Westchester side uh, from Cold Spring Harbor and uh, com Cold Spring you always make that mistake and so it's a great weekend to go for a drive. It is Mother's water. Day. Yeah, that's right and the azaleas as always come out on Mom's Day it's like clockwork every year. It's that's right that's right you know and we, we did get some rain last night which mm. uh, all the, the plants welcome especially mm -hmm. if, you, if you've already planted your vegetables the little seedlings may be sprouting at this point mm -hmm. uh, but it's supposed to be kind of cool for the next week. Well it's been a cold spring and it's the plants have got received a lot of damage we haven't had as much flowers but the weather is the least of our problems. On Monday, they're doing something uh, that we hope the weather will be good for in White Plains, right in front of the uh, the Arts Westchester building, 31 oh, Maranek nice. Avenue. There is a mural that has been painted on the street. It's in one of the lanes of Maranek Avenue. It's in celebration of the uh, Arts Westchester, which used to be known as uh, the Westchester Arts Council, being in that mm -hmm that former bank building for 20 years. Uh, Monday they're going to have a formal um, unveiling ceremony uh, down there. Uh, and uh, this week uh, the, the artist, this is a, a fellow who, who was a graffiti artist, he's now world renowned, um, and uh, his name is Wayne Wan, O-N-E. Uh, that's what he uses. Uh, he used to do graffiti on New York City subway cars. From graffiti yeah. to the street. From graffiti to uh, to, gr yeah. to a, a real mural on the street right. in White Plains. Right. On People to Be Heard, we interview some of the workers of SE, SEIU, and that's on Saturday at 8, uh, Saturday at 7, or on our website, whiteplainsweek.com and YouTube. John Bailey, for Jim Benoff and Peter Katz, good night for good White Plains Week. This has been White Plains Week, news and commentary about White Plains, Westchester, and the world. The views and opinions expressed on this program were solely those of the participants. White Plains Week, produced by White Plains Citizen Net Reporter and presented on Optimum Cable Channel 76 and Verizon Fios Channel 45. You may view White Plains Week anytime on the internet at whiteplainsweek.com, youtube.com, and wpcommunitymedia.org. For White Plains Week, this is Peter Katz speaking.